Yeah, welcome guys. Um, it's really good to have you here, Ben and Scott, obviously with me today from Low Balancer, myself from Low Balancer. And uh, one of the things that we want to talk about today is object storage. So why would we want to talk about object storage? Can you talk about that a little bit? Because you've yeah, done sure. quite a lot of work. Yeah, we're doing, uh, we're doing a lot, a lot of work in object storage at the moment. A lot of our partners and existing customers and new customers are coming to us and talking about object storage and, and you know, load balancing being an important component of it. So we just felt it'd be a good idea to have a bit of a round table around it, have a chat. What is it? Why do you load balance it? Yeah, and so like we would, it. yeah, here All we right. are. So go. tell me, what is object storage? For those that don't know, what is object storage? Yeah, so I'm gonna break this down into really simple things because obviously I'm on the sales side. Of, I've got and for guys, me. You guys, <laughs> you guys are the technical brains, <laughs> apparently. So when I think about object storage, I think of a bucket, and I mean a literal bucket, not a technical storage bucket. I mean a literal plastic bucket where you dump all of your data. So you throw loads and loads of data all in this one bucket. Yeah. Um, huge capacity, relatively cheap compared to other storage types. Um, but it raises the question, how do I get my data back out of the bucket? How do I find it if it's all in there in one place? And that's where this lovely thing called metadata helps you extract your data when you need it. If you compare it to another of the major enterprise storage types, files, file data, um, that's very different. I think of that as a, in analogous terms as a, you know, a building with lots of rooms and each of the rooms has lots of filing cabinets and each filing cabinet has drawers and each drawer has partitions so your data is very very structured so when you want to find it you just know to go to the right room the right cabinet the right drawer the right um section so that's where that's quite different to this whole object storage uh yeah uh, so we have the 60s to thank for uh, a lot of things right great music the coin in the phrase by Philip R. Bagley of Metadata in 1968. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, personally, I was a bit of a late night. <laughs> so, getting off topic now. <laughs> so, um, so some great things to uh, focus yeah. on. Yeah, like, but you're right. We wouldn't have we'd have no object data without metadata. Yeah. I mean, that's the key thing, isn't it? And it is the ability to search, have a big scalable database, a big understanding of lots of blobs of data, which is what object storage is, as opposed to being blobs of data, yeah. um, wrapped around a bit of metadata. So, so yeah, you're right. So, so the, 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 bit, the thing that always, you know, not, not, not troubles me, but interests me is, wh why would you use objects instead of, say, file or like one of the other storage types? What, yeah. what are the main use cases? Right, right. so the, the, the key thing here really is people get confused between this, right? So. Um, Object storage is all about us lumping huge amounts of data, potentially vast amounts of data, in potentially disparate places all over the place, and the ability to scale really, really easily. But it's not vast. You know, it can be. We can optimize it. We can do things to make it quicker. But it's not like the hard drive spinning inside our PC. That's file storage. You know, that is that is quick, simple. In IT terms, we're worrying about SANs and storage platforms and bits and pieces where we want high speed disks that run virtual machines where we're paging memory onto disk and things like that. And that's got to be quick and fast and 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 structured, like a filing cabinet example, right? We yeah. need to know where to go to get stuff. Object storage is is all about scale, volume, and it doesn't necessarily always need to be fast. So great for backups, great for kind of big data depositories, data lakes, artificial intelligence, things like that. File level storage. PC servers, USB keys, flash flash storage, things like that. So it's not it's it's fair to say that object storage can also have all these mediums. It can have spinning disks and flash storage and all these kind of bits and pieces. But it's the way we engage with it that's totally different. We're we're driven by APIs and calls and metadata. Um, and we we don't care really about how structured that data is and whether it's a particular pdf file or dot word document we don't care about files we care about random blobs of data with ones and zeros in with a tiny little file metadata attached to it saying this is part one of nine go and find the other eight and that's where this whole concept of unstructured data versus structured data right. comes in right. yeah cool All right. so what does it do then so what you're saying is due to metadata because i only think of metadata when I look at cameras and I remember seeing my first digital camera and yeah. metadata was yeah. part yeah. of it and how that was stored. And I guess in this way, what you're saying is it breaks up these pieces of data 
Can do, yeah. it on separate disks somewhere. Yeah, can do. And can then do. using that metadata to synchronize it up. Yeah, so, so you've got choices. It's sometimes it's, it's simpler to, and quicker to transfer certain block sizes of data yeah. rather than massive, massive blocks or lots and lots of tiny blocks. Um, sometimes it's easier to break a really big file up into pieces and then stream those pieces all at the same time, pull them all out of the system at the same time and get much more, you know, much faster, faster network. More like packet sizes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, but it's a balancing act. So depending on which object storage provider you use, you can have lots of choices about the packet size, what the what the actual data is that you're pulling out. And this touches slightly on some of the things that we do. You know, like if we're pulling out one big file, let's say we're watching a video, yeah. and we're pulling, we want to download that video, we can pull one big file that might be four gig in size, and I'm going to slowly download each bit at a time. And I put buffering, buffering. Yeah, 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 but I'm pulling each little bit at a time. Whereas actually, when you introduce load balancing, we could have lots of servers yeah. where we're pulling data from all of them. Ben, why would we uh, load balance? I was going to ask Scott there. I'll attempt to answer it. And Scott, you're really going to have to dig me out this one quickly. So I'm going to say quite a first. Go on. Yeah, Go brilliant. On. My, my high level understanding is that where object differs to other storage types is a lot of the time object is using HTTP. So you can almost load balance object storage nodes yeah. in a similar way that you might load balance a server, for example. Yeah. Tell me if that's nonsense. No, that's an absolutely valid point. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why we do it. One <laughs> it's a valid point, it's right. One of, it's one of, tell it's us why we do it, really. Then. So, okay, first question. If we look at why we can load balance object storage, mm -hmm. as opposed to, if we think about this file, going back to file storage, right, we're not going to load balance a USB drive. That's a, not, that's a typical example of, you know, of a USB drive, right? Yeah. Uh, it's a typical example of a, a file-based storage platform. That, you know, we're only ever going to go to one USB drive. If I had five or six USB drives, yeah. and they all have the same bit of data on them, then there's an argument to say we could load back. You wouldn't. It's ridiculous. It's a yeah, stupid yeah. comment. But with object storage, we're talking about such big scale yeah. and so many disks, yeah. and we want redundancy, and we want resilience, and we want speed, and we want all these advantages that we can get to. With lots of with object storage, typically we're looking at not one file server, which people might be used to. We're looking at five or six file servers. Yeah. In object storage land, we call those nodes. Yeah. Right? They are nodes sitting in the background with lumps of disk and compute. And in all of those, I can make a request to all of them at the same time, potentially, to pull some files out, right? And or I can I can make a request into one and only ever deal with one storage storage node. Or if but if I wanted to, I can increase the bandwidth and the available traffic that I can create. Well, my first request to go into server one, and whilst it's dealing with it, my second request to go into server two, the third one to go into server three, means we get a lot more bandwidth, a lot more scalability in our Yeah, so I was just going to say, on that, I was just going to say, it's much more of a scale out model. Correct. So, higher quantity of smaller nodes potentially. Absolutely. Like a classic scale out model. Yep. Hence, if you've got that, lots of disparate nodes, lots of different locations, yep. how do you get the right request to the right node at the right time? Absolutely. Which is the fundamental correct. premise of the load balance. Yeah, right? correct. Absolutely. And also, one of the great things that we can do there is you can say, you know, what happens if one of those nodes goes offline? It dies, it falls over, it fails. One of the services that aren't running on the back end of the server. Let's say we've got five back-end storage servers, it means that one in five requests yeah. will fail and it won't work. So actually, by putting a load balancer in front of it, we can help check that service. Are you alive? Are you working? Are you, yeah. are you, are you in a position to serve up customers' content? Yeah. And if it is, we allow in the ball. And if it, if it isn't, then through orchestration, we just literally shut that back-end yeah. server offline and we don't forward any traffic to it anymore. Which means 100% of our requests come back valid, not Yeah, I'm going to say something dangerous having heard half of part of one of your conversations mm. once before, Scott. I know we can get a lot more clever than just help checking, is it alive, is it dead? Yeah. We can do all sorts of really clever things around, you know, which nodes are busiest, and that can be based on all sorts of different parameters. But actually, you can get to some quite sophisticated load balancing algorithms to really make sure that you're, you're performing as high as you can because we touched earlier on object storage is yeah. generally a relatively cost effective alternative to other storage types mm -hmm. but sometimes suffers in terms of performance so yeah. if you can put methods in place to optimize the performance of your object storage you can actually get 
relatively low cost and pretty good performance. Right. Yeah. I think with the move to NVMe drives, it is getting better though, right? As yeah. far as yeah. storage is concerned yeah. on that side. Performance ratio. I was going to come back to something because this is another thing that we had on a recent customer call. Yeah. Um, performance. So is there an argument for having dedicated load balances just for your object storage, or should you just use the load balances that you've already got? Well, okay, so, so in my opinion, this depends entirely upon who's who's owning that object storage platform, right? If it's, if it's a customer, if I'm, if I'm running my own object storage platform, I'm building my own and I've got complete control over it, and I'm responsible for the uptime of the object storage platform, then fair enough, there's an argument to say I've used a load balancer that I've already got. But that load balancer might be doing more than one thing. It might be doing, you know, at 10 o'clock every night, it's doing a beam backup. Right? But it just so happens. It goes to the object storage anyway. Well, so if it's going through a load, <laughs> if it's going through a load balancer, yeah. it's, it's, it could be. Beam yeah. backup could be going off to object storage. It might be going to its own SAN. It might be going off site to another data center. It might be going wherever, right? Ultimately, if there's another load that's going through the load balance at the same time, we call it noisy neighbor, yeah. right? Where effectively we've got another service pulling resources and drain on the load balancer, and that's having an impact potentially on the throughput of the load balancer to the object storage platform. So if you if we're talking about the 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 the, the object storage provider, if I was an object storage provider, yeah. I'd be absolutely freaking out and panicking yeah. if my customer said to me, can I carry on using my load balances? Because I, as an object storage provider, I've got a commitment to a certain SLA, a certain uptime, a certain throughput. Yeah. And the problem I'd have with that is that if I, if I allow my customer to be the front entry door point into my object storage platform, and then they go and do a load of crazy stuff on their load balancer, then my SLAs and my, my performance metrics are not going to be valid. I might be able to achieve that on the storage platform, but the customer's the entry point, and it's going to muck that up. See, that, that's really interesting to me on the sales side because mm -hmm. I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, right, you know, what, what do I do for a living? I sell load balances, right? Of course, I'm going to say you need dedicated load balances. <laughs> yeah, of course. Why, yeah, why, yeah, you, why would you need anything else? Yeah, it's yeah, crazy yeah. to tell you you don't. Yeah. But it's actually really interesting to hear it in those terms that it's not only about the customer getting the right level of performance, it's also actually about protecting the storage vendor themselves because as you've just said and i you know i spent some time working in the storage space so i know a lot of the time when you're selling storage to enterprises the requirements are around a certain amount of capacity and throughput and performance yeah. and if you don't live up to those promised metrics yeah you're in a world of pain because you, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Miss, you either right. miss expectations or you upset the customer worst of all they end up having to spend more money yeah. Um, no, so it's, it's, it's but you also end up as the vendor who's then having to prove that it's the customer's load balance of the yeah. rather yeah. than their own equipment. So no, it's, it's horrible. But implementations, I guess, of object storage come with their own switches. That's been my experience anyway, right? So well, they use most load. Load. They use Yeah, I mean, it depends. You're right. Load. It depends on the vendor. Generally, they've got a preferred, yeah. you know, preferred provider around switching and around around, around the networking piece. Yeah, so be right. dedicated for that, and the yeah. Pain yeah, should yeah. be for load balances. I think mean, you're right. It's it's another piece of networking equipment. Just that's like definitely switch. true for SAN environments. Yeah. So you would, you know, if you were putting in a new SAN environment, you would normally put in some kind of fiber switching as part of that. Um, is it? A little bit less common. Object storage, because it's running over the network, what we typically would see is object storage areas being VLAN'd off, being carved off, something like that. Um, if there's communication between the back end storage nodes, yeah, I'd expect the storage vendor to want to put their own hardware, their own equipment in to run that. Um, but it's the point that it breaks out into the customer's, customer's network that, that suddenly you have a question over do you control those sort of that switching? But, but it goes back to the customer having control of the load balancer and the active network. Or the vendor having control of that, that, that active network. Typically, in the customer's environment, it's going to be the networking level is sat with the customer. But I personally think you need to have it there as a storage vendor. You need to be dishing your own appliances. You want to know what change brings, right? Because, um, exactly. you know, I've done enough sessions or CADs or whatever you want to call it to discuss changes, especially around, you know, low balances at the time. And it is very problematic because if something does go wrong, even though you've got two there, something goes wrong in that change window. That's a potential for your backup not to run or yeah, yeah, whatever it is not to run. Stress stress. Stress. Yeah, it can cause all sorts of issues. So you're right. I like, and it's the same for me when I look at load balancing anyway. 
that I don't like to mix my internal and external load balances. So if I've got GSLB running on the outside, mm -hmm. I like to keep that on the outside and I like to keep my internal traffic inside, inside yeah. on separate internal load balances. We've, uh, we've boys, we've lapsed into uh, talking about load balances because that's what yeah. we did. I think we were, we were mainly talking about load balances. We've fallen into our own Yeah, we have. Yeah. But, uh, I, think, I think we've actually covered the fundamentals, the basics of object mix. So should we, should we call it a day for now? I, I think we can. The next, uh, I think, next subject. Yeah, I think we I can. Think it's lunchtime. Yeah. Perfect.